Welcome everyone to the global impact of US democracy under fire, what lawyers can do. Our program is being presented as part of the week-long Rule of Law Webathon. Now in its third year, the theme of the 2023 Webathon is upholding the rule of law in challenging times. The rule of law is society's legal underpinning, guaranteeing human rights, creating economic opportunity, and fostering development. As lawyers, we are often the first line of defense for the rule of law. What about democracy? Do we play the same role there? This week's webathon is a joint project of four of the world's leading associations of international lawyers. The International Law Section of the American Bar Association, the ABA, the International Association of Lawyers, UIA, the Inter-American Bar Association, IABA, and the International Association of Young Lawyers, IESIA. This program on the state of democracy in the United States is a production of the International Law Section of the American Bar Association. Democracy is under siege worldwide. The statistics are alarming. In the United States, nearly 70% say democracy serves only the wealthy and powerful, and more than 40% foresee civil war within a decade. Similar numbers say having a strong leader is more important than democracy. That's a particularly alarming um, factoid in light of the um, concept that that's often the way societies slide into autocracy is a, a preference for strong leadership and results and efficiency over democracy. In any event, as evidenced most memorably by the US Capitol insurrection on January 6, 2021, democratic norms in the United States are eroding marked by a crisis of faith in fundamental principles. And these developments have profound implications well beyond the US itself. Increasingly, allies are questioning whether the United States can be relied upon in world affairs like climate change and immigration, refugee affairs, and despots around the world cite US retrenchment to justify their own strong arm rule. Let me take just a moment to explain our format. We're going to begin with brief remarks by Professor Cass Sunstein, including an opportunity for questions and commentary by our other panelists, as well as the audience. So those of you in the audience, if you have questions for Professor Sunstein, be sure to type them into the Q&A box right away because we will be excusing him after his presentation is concluded. After his remarks, we're going to segue into a different format, more of a TV talk show format, instead of the dreaded talking heads where each speaker in turn takes you know, 12 to 15 minutes to talk at the audience, we're going to facilitate a conversation among our other three distinguished panelists. My name is Judge Delisa Ridgeway of the U.S. Court of International Trade based in New York. I'm a member of the Governing Council of the ABA's International Law Section, as well as a member of the ABA's United Nations Delegation. In addition, I serve on the Asia Council of the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative, known as ABA Rowley. I'm honored to be serving as your moderator. Complete bios for all of our panelists are available online, so I'm going to keep my intros here quite brief. Professor Sunstein is currently the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard University. In addition, he's the founder and director of Harvard Law School's uh, Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. He is regarded as the world's preeminent behavioral economist. He has served in a number of senior posts in the Obama administration. From 2009 to 2012, he served in the White House as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, affectionately known as OIRA. If you're an administrative law geek like I am, you know that the administrator of OIRA is one of the least known but most powerful positions in any presidential administration. In 2018, the professor received the Holberg Prize from the government of Norway. That honor is sometimes described as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for contributions to law and the humanities. 
Professor Sunstein is the author of hundreds of articles and dozens of books, including the New York Times bestseller, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Apropos of our topic today, he co-edited the book, Can It Happen Here? Authoritarianism in America. And one of his more recent articles is titled, The Moment I Knew That U.S. Democracy Was in Mortal Danger. I think he's going to give us a caveat now. He's wearing several different hats, and so his remarks are going to be cabined a bit today. The professor has been named one of the leading public intellectuals of our time. Can't imagine what it's like to bear that mantle. Um, and uh, a fun fact, uh, Professor Sunstein is half of one of the world's leading power couples. He is married to Samantha Power, who is currently administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. And from 2013 to 2017, she served as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Professor Sunstein, we're honored to have you here. The floor is yours. Set the stage for us. And let me remind the other panelists that uh, once he is finished, we're going to turn the floor over to the rest of you for questions and comments. Um, and then we will go to the audience. So audience, again, type your questions in now if you have questions for Professor Sunstein. Professor? Thank you so much. And it's an honor to get to talk to you all. Speaking of my wife, uh, former ambassador, now administrator of power, I noticed that the TV show, The Diplomat, the actor, Carrie Russell, who is uh, playing the lead dresses and kind of talks a little like my wife. And I thought, is this coincidental? And then it, it turns out that she said in interviews that she's read a lot and kind of modeled herself after uh, Ambassador Power. And she, she, my wife, that is, is traveling overseas right now. But there are these big... Um, uh, paintings or photographs of Carrie Russell in Georgetown, near where we live, that are looking a lot like Ambassador Power. So mm -hmm. I want to thank publicly uh, actress, ambassador, kind of uh, Russell for keeping me company in that way during my wife's absence. Okay, so these remarks are motivated by actually some behavioral work that seems far afield from our topic of democracy. And I'm gonna give you a little glimpse at it and then go right at democracy. If you see a lot of very angry faces, really very angry faces, and then you see some faces that are kind of borderline angry or a little bit angry, and you're asked which faces that you see are angry, you tend to see only the very angry faces as angry and the kind of angry faces you think of as completely fine, not angry at all. Then as the number of very angry faces dwindles in the experimental setting, then you start seeing the mildly angry faces as angry, which is to suggest that what we see as normal and standard greatly affects our judgment about anger, about ethics, about colors, and also about democracy. If a government jails people because of their political convictions, that's not a very democratic thing to do. But if it does that, you might not think that it's so terrible if public officials start reading your email. If you live in a society in which public officials routinely steal money for their own use, that's inconsistent with democracy's morality. You might not much mind if an official asks for a little bribe in exchange for you letting you open a small business. What provokes our outrage and gets actually the amygdala in the brain fired up depends on what surrounds us. Not so long ago, it was normal for public schools in the United States to require students to pray every morning. Not so long ago, it was normal for people to drive without seat belts and to smoke in public buildings. Not so long ago, people tended to take democratic self-government so much for granted that it was not seen as needing justification. At the same time, they had a concrete understanding of what democracy entailed, such that departures from that understanding were not normal. 
they were essentially unthinkable. Those who seek to promote and maintain democratic goals work really hard to maintain a sense of what is normal. They often suggest that if certain groups are denied the right to participate in politics, something has gone horribly wrong. We can see them, democracy entrepreneurs, let's call them, as trying to enlarge people's understanding of the normal. They might try to change the very meaning of the right to participate in politics, for example, by calling for automatic voter registration and for allowing convicted felons to vote. Movements for democratic self-government, old and new, proceed in this way. Those who seek to undermine democratic goals actually use a similar strategy. They might suggest that restrictions on the right to vote or on freedom of the press are normal, the kind of thing that leaders simply do. Movements toward authoritarianism, old and new, proceed in just this way. In Nazi Germany and in other nations, they might start slowly and move incrementally, an approach that, given human psychology, makes good psychological sense. They might start slowly and then accelerate rapidly. Whoosh. That approach too can work if they have coercion on their side and could move public opinion. These points cast, I think, a skeptical light on one of the most famous claims about democracy ever, Winston Churchill's claim that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those forms that have been tried from time to time. I confess I hate Churchill's claim. I love Churchill, but I hate this claim. Churchill was clever, but his claim is elitist. Actually, it's a terrible thing to say. Democracy is not the least bad form of government. It is the best. It's the best for two different reasons. First, democracy is rooted in a commitment to the equal dignity of human beings. Let's put that in large font and bold letters. Because of that commitment, it is committed to people's right to govern themselves. Democracy insists that each of us is entitled to have a voice in determining our nation's course. Democracy rests on a belief that sovereignty lies in the people, not a king, not a party, not a monarch, and not a dictator. That belief depends on a judgment that no human being and no group of people should be subordinated to another. In an amazing quote from 1954, Abraham Lincoln put it this way, and I wish these words were on some monument, the Lincoln Memorial maybe. What Lincoln said about slavery was, when the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also give, governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. No man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. I say this is the leading principle, the sheet anchor of American republicanism. Notice here the linkage of the attack on slavery as inconsistent with the right to self-government with the embrace of American republicanism, read democracy, saying they rest on the same principle. The idea of a sheet anchor links self-government in people's individual capacities, you and I, with self-governance as a political ideal. And in my various travels, I can say, I've been privileged to go to countries of diverse kinds with diverse religious convictions, diverse cultural ideals. The idea of self-government in people's individual capacities resonates humanly. It doesn't resonate culturally. It, it, it goes at homo sapiens, not as homo americanus or homo europeanus. A sheet anchor is no ordinary anchor. It's the most reliable one you have, the one least likely to fail under stress. 
Lincoln was suggesting that if a culture embraces the human ideal of individual autonomy, its commitment to self-government will be secure. That's the first idea. The second is a recognition that self-governing institutions are likely to govern better and help people to enjoy better lives. For one reason, democratic institutions are responsive to the people. When public officials stand for election, they have a pretty strong incentive to focus on people's well-being. Whatever their status, they might have the word honorable in front of the na their name, but they are servants. Continue the, consider the remarkable finding by Nobel Prize winner Marja Sen that in the entire history of the world, there has never been a famine in a nation with a democratic press and free elections. Pause over that if you would. Famines are a social product not an inevitable result of food scarcity. Even when food is limited, officials can find a way to ensure against mass starvation. When will they do that? The answer depends on incentives and information. If there's a democratic system with free press and free speech, the government is under constant pr pressure to ensure that people generally have access to food. And when officials' jobs depend on responding, they respond. Of course, this isn't merely a point about famines. It's a point about human suffering of all kind. Popular control is no guarantee, and no one should doubt that non-democratic governments sometimes perform well. But popular control increases the likelihood that government will actually serve people's interests. If the people are sovereign, back to Lincoln, they're ultimately in charge. Some people, including some academic friends whom I cherish, think there is a tension between democracy and human rights. De human rights are a check on democracy on this view, and some Democrats aren't that excited about human rights. There is such a thing as illiberal democracy, for example, when democracy leads to widespread censorship. If the people want to suppress freedom, but the nation respects the right to freedom, that right will stand in the people's way. It is tempting to think that full-blown democracy can compromise rights and that rights compromise democracy. I want to urge that's a terrible mistake, much worse than mere confusion, and Lincoln helps explain why. Democracy has its own internal morality. The rule of law has an internal morality. It's not democracy, by the way. It's a morality of clarity, generality, no retroactivity, operation in the world like operation of the books. That's the rule of law's morality. Democracy's morality, internal morality, includes freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to vote, freedom of association. The reason is the Lincoln asked principles that justify democracy, including the right to equal dignity, call for rights of just that kind. The justification for democracy is a justification of some human rights as well. In any democracy, a free press cannot be treated as an enemy of the people. And describing the press in that savage way expands, not for the better, the sense of what is normal. Of course, it's true that the idea of democratic government can reasonably be understood in various ways. A parliamentary system can be democratic, so can a presidential system. That is fine. Democracy is a pretty wide tent. After World War II, the argument for democracy seemed secure, even overwhelming. Here's a shining star, West Germany, with its iconic constitutional commitment in Article I, human dignity shall be inviolable. The respect and protect it shall be the duty of all state authority. There's a line between Abraham Lincoln and Article I of now the German constitution. Sure, billions of people lived under non-democratic systems, 
But in principle, democracy had the high moral ground. It is a sign of its primacy that so many countries labeled themselves democracies and republics even when they were not. For example, the German Democratic Republic and the People's Republic of Korea. For the last decades of the 20th century and a good chunk of the 21st, democracy was plainly ascendant. Things are not the same today. Democracy is being tested in multiple ways. Its historical and social contingency is clear as its, its fragility. The idea of equal dignity is under siege from authoritarians of all kinds. If we examine the power of what is taken to be normal, we can better appreciate the contingency of democratic arrangements and their fragility. Things can break down, at least to some extent, in a relative hurry. At the Virginia Ratifying Convention, Lincoln's precursor, James Madison, put it this way, I go on this great Republican principle that the people will have the virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render it us secure. If there be sufficient and virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of leaders. We should understand Madison to be drawing on the tradition of civic republicanism, a foundation of democracy today, which emphasizes not only citizens' rights, but also their obligation to participate in public affairs and to do so independently, bravely, securely, and with their critical faculties intact. That is part and parcel of democracy's understanding of equal dignity. And it is a predicate for the idea that when democracy works well, it will increase the likelihood that people's lives will go well too. With apologies to Churchill, Churchill, with its internal morality, democracy is the best form of government, including all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. It is a luxury and also a blessing to be able to take it as normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so I want to first open up the floor to our um, uh, our other panelists for any comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those uh, thought-provoking remarks, Professor Sunstein. So I'm perhaps going to throw you a little bit of a curveball, but since you wrote Nudge, there's been an explosion in computing power, and we now have Chat GPT. And so some years ago, there was uh, the development of computer mediated discourse analysis, sort of looking at what's being discussed. And now online, there's this wealth of information. And I'm just kind of curious if you have dipped your toe in, and apologies if you've already published on this and I missed it, but because um, when I just you know skim the internet myself or turn on a television, you know, I, I personally, and this is, of course, just an anecdotal reaction, but I personally see a decline in the civic discourse and an increasing hostility and simplification of very complex issues. And I'm just curious as to whether you've delved into that yourself and what your thoughts are. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a, a great point and great question. One thing that I think is evidently a challenge for democracies is the creation of echo chambers. So if you are um, a certain type, let's say your political convictions are of an identifiable sort, you can find a lot of people who are like that. Now that's part of freedom, so it's okay. But if it turns out that you are hearing louder and louder, louder echoes of your vo own voice, you might start believing things that are really false. You might start thinking of people who are outside of the echo chamber as demons and barely human. You might uh, 
think a more extreme version of what you thought before you were in the echo chamber. I did a little experiment uh, with colleagues in Colorado uh, not very long ago, in which we got people right of center to talk about various issues, just right of center people talking about issues, but left of center people talking about various issues. And we found out what happened to their views after they talked with one another. And basically the right was here, this is to my right, and the left was here before they started to talk. And the distance between, that's not big distance. They were occupying the same political universe. But after they talked to each other for about half an hour about climate change and same sex stuff and affirmative action, the left was here. Can't see my left hand and that's by design. It's really far left <laughs> and here. That's also by design. They were in different universes. And our little Colorado experiment to your point is being replicated online every minute of every day. It's happening right now. And that's uh, a challenge, let's say, for uh, Republican virtue. So I, ap I apologize. My, my um, internet went out for a second, and I'm sorry I didn't hear the last conversation. But Professor, thank you for your, 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 your remarks. I, I'd like to hear you speak for a minute about uh, your views about federalism today compared to what people thought it would uh, mean 200 years ago and, 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 and address the question of the tyranny of the minority that, that we see as at the root of so much of what's going wrong in America. Great question. So at the founding, there were two things that were appreciated about federalism. One is that if your state was doing something you didn't like, you could leave and be free of the oppression. And the other thing is the state would know that it would, before the fact that it would lose citizens if it did bad things, and that would discourage it from doing bad things. Okay. Roosevelt and the New Dealers thought uh, we've got to be careful about that, because suppose we want child labor laws. People are going to leave, so you can't get child labor laws at the state level. Or suppose you wanted um, minimum wage and maximum hour laws. Good luck with that, they thought, at least in some states where you lose business. So the Roosevelt thought was, if you want democracy, you sometimes got to rely on Washington because it's going to, there's going to be a mutually destructive race to the bottom among the states. And while that was a major thought and a rethinking of federalism, it was con continuous with Madison and to your point about minority uh, uh, rule that Madison and Federalist 10, who said that if you enlarge the sphere, you can reduce the power of well-organized private groups because there are going to be a lot of them and in a larger republic, uh, they can balance off each other and maybe we can figure out the right thing to do. So I, th I think you, you're, you're completely right that federalism has uh, some risks associated with it, where you can sometimes get, capture a state house where it would be really hard to capture Washington. Now, federalism still has many great features, you know, the people in, Mississippi and the people in Massachusetts don't think the right way, according to each other, but they may think reasonably given their situations that they're in. And uh, that that's that's within boundaries, that's okay. Uh, part of the reason for constitutional rights of various kinds is a restriction on things that states might want to do. And of course, uh, Lincoln had very interesting views about, about slavery uh, that are captured in the quotation, and that complicated his own view of how to think about federalism. I'll, I'll jump in, um, and uh, thank you, Professor Sunstein, for the very thought-provoking remarks. Um, we at the World Justice Project gather a lot of data for our rule of law index, and it, it um, underscores some of the things that you were um, reflecting on, and, and particularly that democracy may be feeling less and less normal. Um, and our surveys of Americans, a representative national survey of Americans, for example, 
um, asked whether the media can express opinions against the government without fear of retaliation. In 2016, 83% said yes. In uh, 2021, it was just 65% said yes. Um, similarly, uh, in 2016, we asked whether people can vote freely without feeling harassment or pressure. And 91% said yes in 2016. In 2021, that was just 58%. So a pretty marked deterioration in what feels normal um, in, in that data. And, and we also see in our, in our global index data that whoosh that you described, a certain momentum behind some of these trends. So the countries that decline the most in our rule of law index are those that have kind of hit a tipping point, are at the lower um, part of the index, and then they really seem to fall off the cliff. So with that backup, I'm interested in how do we how do we reverse course? How do we turn these things around? And maybe um, in light of today's theme, what what specifically do you think lawyers can and should be doing uh, to to turn things around? Well, uh, there are two ideals that democracy responds to. One is individual dignity and the other is performance. And uh, showing is better than telling, but clarity about what democracies do compared to what nations that aren't democratic do, that's something lawyers can display. Lawyers can speak to history and achievement. Often that's uh, motivating. Martin Luther King Day has a uh, an educative function for people. I think it's precious. July 4th can do that, but in a way, July 4th is now more about explosions than about Concord and Lexington. Lawyers can help there. So if you go back to uh, Paul Revere's ride and uh, Concord and Lexington, that's overwhelming with respect to what our country was founded on. It was a principle, by the way, of equal dignity. And while you know we wish Prince, now King, Charles well, there's something, I'll, I'll tell you, can I tell you a little story that I think it's really a lawyer's story that maybe we can spin out ideas. Uh, uh, I was privileged to clerk for Justice Thurgood Marshall, and he told us a story of his meeting uh, a prince. I don't remember the name, but part of the royal family. And the prince said to him in a very, um, you know, royal accent, looking down on him emotionally, though Marshall was pretty tall, said, would you like to know what I think of lawyers? And Marshall responded, would you like to know what I think of princes? <laughs> That's a perfect American response, isn't it? It's, it's, it's so precise. Yeah. They became great friends, by the way. Marshall was <laughs> too, um, too genial and uh, lovable to, be, to have a fight. The, the, but the prince respected him and completely got it. I love that story. Um, you know, I promised you, Professor, that we would get you out of here on a schedule, and I want to honor uh, my commitment. But we do have um, two questions from the audience. I hope that I do them, no pun intended, I hope that I do them justice, um, the sort of little fragments um, could you speak about how the, and I'm going to give you the exact words, the immoral and initial relationship, I'm not sure initial is the word, uh, relationship with indigenous peoples affects the breakdown of democracy? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. So um, I would get, twist it a little bit how democracy improves the relationship with indigenous persons. So there are ideals in democracy. This is what Martin Luther King was of, uh, you know, extremely clear on. He said, all we are saying is be truthful to what you said on paper. So he was using democratic ideals as a critique of existing practices. 
rather than using existing practices as an obliteration of the ideals. And so I think I'd say that some of the, uh, you know, improvements with respect to recognition of indigenous people are an outgrowth of uh, democratic principles, both that no person can rule another and also equal dignity. Thank you. Um, and uh, a second question, um, quite specific. Uh, does chat GPT fall under First Amendment rights? Yeah. Oh, nice that you ask. I have a paper on exactly that question. <laughs> A new unpublished paper. It's available on the Social Science Research Network. That's not a good way of getting your articles out to people, but I did my best. Um, the sh short answer is that ChatGPT, like a stove or a window, does not have First Amendment rights, even if the window creaks or the stove shrieks. They don't have First Amendment rights. But the people who interact with and listen to ChatGPT, listen or read, do have First Amendment rights. So there's an old Supreme Court case called Kleindienst against Mandel, which is the closest, I think, and probably it's from 1965, where Americans wanted people from overseas to come in. The State Department said you can't come in. The people who wanted to come in were relevantly like ChatGPT. They were human not uh, large language models, so far as I understand, unless this is a science fiction story rather than a truthful story. Uh, th they didn't have any rights, but the Supreme Court said, but the people who want to listen to them, they have rights. And so if the government said that ChatGPT can't say anything critical of Congress, that would violate the First Amendment, that would be viewpoint-based, or if the government said ChatGPT can't talk about American history, that would probably violate the First Amendment. It would be a content-based restriction. There are a thousand and one things you could say ChatGPT can't do, can't bribe, can't have false commercial advertising, can't have child pornography. Those are things that are not protected by the First Amendment. And so that would be... Uh, permissible to ensure against. I'm not at all surprised that you have a paper out on this. Um, uh, I, I, you know, at one point when I was thinking about how to introduce you, I was thinking about, um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, listing the encyclopedic array of topics on which you have published. And then it occurred to me that it would actually be much more efficient just to try to list the topics on which you have not published. But anyway, I abandoned that and, and I would have had chat GPT on the list and I would have been mistaken. So thank you very much for that. Um, that is, um, those are the questions that we have from the audience thus far. So, um, and and I'm right on schedule to get you out of here. Um, would, are there any closing thoughts that you would like to leave us with? I, I just wanna say what an honor and a pleasure it is to see everyone on this screen doing amazing work for the world and also to uh, thank the people who are listening. Uh, Justice Holmes said it's possible to live greatly in the law and that's what you're all doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, um, again, this is one of the great frustrations of um, uh, this virtual world that we live in, but I hope that you can hear virtually the audience's applause for your appearance here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thanks to you. Tell Carrie Russell hello for us. Um. All right, now we're going to, um, by the way, it's, it occurred to me very belatedly that I've had faces up here with names and I haven't introduced any of you. So that's a, a shortcoming of my methodology. I apologize for that. But in any event, now we're going to segue into our conversation with the three uh, remaining distinguished panelists. And again, because their bios are online, I'm going to keep the introductions short to allow maximum time for our substantive conversation.
presentation. So in alphabetical order, we have first Elizabeth. She goes by Betsy Anderson. She's the executive director of the World Justice Project, where she leads its global efforts to advance the rule of law. Betsy has more than 25 years of experience in the international legal arena. She previously served as director of the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative and as executive director of the American Society of International Law. In addition, at Human Rights Watch, she served as executive director of their Europe and Central Asia division, among many other positions that she's held. She's been honored with a number of awards over the course of her career for her work in the international rule of law field, including a Williams College Bicentennial Medal, the American Society of International Law's Prominent Women in International Law Award, and the ABA International Law Section's World Order Under Law Award. Welcome, Betsy. Next up is Scott Carlson. Scott currently serves as Associate Executive Director for Global Programs for the ABA. Scott's legal career spans more than 30 years and includes over two decades in the fields of international development and the rule of law. He began his rule of law work back in the early 1990s. In the years since then, he has worked in both field-based and headquarters settings for and with a multitude of institutions that is frankly far too long to list. Notably, however, while serving in the ABA's Washington, D.C. offices from 1999 to 2003, he led the implementation of ABA Rowley's first assessment test, Rowley's Judicial Reform Index. And you're going to hear a little bit more about these various indices um, uh, and um, uh, ranking and rating systems, I think, as our conversation progresses. Scott is widely published on a wide range of topics in the fields of rule of law, human rights, anti-corruption, and international law in general. And two fun facts about him. He was awarded a much coveted US Supreme Court Fellowship, and he is fluent not only in French, but also in Albanian. Who knew? Thank you for joining us today, Scott. And our third or fourth, depending on how you're counting, panelist is Judge Andre M. Davis. Judge Davis is a federal circuit judge retired from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He has the distinction of having served on the bench at virtually every level of the state and federal judiciary, first as a trial judge and later as an appellate judge in the state of Maryland. Then in 1995, he was appointed by President Clinton to the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. And in 2009, he was appointed by President Obama to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. So trial judge myself, I have to tell you how much we love it when trial judges are elevated to the appellate bunch because um, you know so frequently um, appellate judges are scholars, brilliant, but they don't really understand the rough and tumble of day-to-day uh, -day trial work. So, but he's been on both the trial and appellate benches at both the state and federal levels, just speaks volumes about what he brings to the judiciary. Uh, Judge Davis took senior status in 2014, but continued to carry a full caseload. In 2017, he retired from the federal bench to serve as city solicitor in his beloved hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. And he served for, I think, two to three years in that capacity. He also has some impressive international credentials to his credit. Over the course of his 30-year judicial career, he was active in numerous national and international judicial and legal education and rule of law training programs through his membership on the U.S. Judicial Conference's Committee on International Judicial Relations, among other avenues. He was appointed to that very prestigious committee by Chief Justice John Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court. The judge has had programs, uh, trainings, and seminars that he's led in countries including Russia, Armenia, Poland, Ukraine, Kosovo, Swaziland, Nigeria, Uganda, South Africa, Tanzania, Mali, and Egypt. Um, you can imagine what his passport looks like. Judge Davis is um, uh, just, I can tell you, one of the most uh, highly respected jurists in the United States and is known as a deep thinker and a thought leader among his peers. Um, Judge Davis, thank you for being here. 
Okay, remember audience, don't be shy. And I'm, I'm really pleased that we've, um, you know, that we've got some questions coming from the audience. So please do keep them coming. Um, and, and, and we'll try to weave some in um, into the conversation and to the extent we don't get to them, we'll get to them at, at the end after um, the panelists' official presentations. So do use the Q&A box for your questions. Let's start at the beginning then. Um, what is the state? of democracy in the United States? Well, I'll jump in. Um, I, I already shared a little bit of the data that the World Justice Project has, which paints a, a worrying picture of negative trends on, on um, freedom of expression, on voting rights. And, um, and I'll just really reinforce those findings that we, we have in our, in our WJP rule of law index. And I'd encourage folks on the program to um, to look at those on our website and really dig into that data. It's quite revealing. Uh, the U.S. in uh, 2022, our most recent index, ranked 26th out of 140 countries that we measure in the index, looking at a wide range of issues relating to the rule of law, including um, uh, elements that we associate very closely with democracy. Um, and, and some of the worrying trends. We've been declining since 2016 in the index, and um, we've seen worrying trends in particular with respect to constraints on government powers, those those checks and balances that are so important as an undergirding for democracy. We're down 15% in that area in the index. Our measures of fundamental rights, freedom of expression, association, um, and so on, uh, is down uh, 9% in the index in that uh, period. Um, and, uh, and, and the specific measures of, of free expression are even um, falling more sharply, 16% there. Judicial checks on executive authority down 16% over this period in our index. And importantly for democracy, um, the, the indicator that we have for whether transition of power is subject to the law is also down 10% in our index uh, over this period. So we had a slight uptick in, in, in a number of these areas between 2021 and 2022, but we're still well below where we were in, at the last high point of 2016. So we've got a lot of work to do. And um, I can share additional thoughts about what we ought to do, but maybe I'll let the others chime in. I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Uh, so, I'll give you what my fireside chat is, Lisa, with friends and family, because I, I, I do this a lot, actually, because I, I take it as a personal responsibility to talk about these things. I should say I'm saying this in my personal capacity, though I'm an ABA staffer. These views don't reflect the ABA per se. But I, I, tell, I start and tell people, this is what it must have felt like to live in interwar Germany, where there's demonizing minorities of all stripes, and it's happening quickly. It's also accompanied by right-wing violence. The, meanwhile, the mainstream media, which has been attacked for years as being liberal, has retreated from its role as the fourth estate, shedding investigative uh, and fact-gathering capacity in favor of charismatic talking heads that are focused on advertising dollars. Meanwhile, the courts have become, I think, increasingly politicized with the, our own very own Supreme Court, where I was a fellow displaying, I think, resistance to transparency and accountability. And this has led to sharp declines in this venerable institution's respect in the public. It's at a, it's, today, I think the headline was, it's at a 50 year low. Um, meanwhile, one major party uh, jettisoned the customary practice of developing current policy proposals in the 2020 presidential election. Of course, they claimed that the pandemic was hindering this process, and but instead they focused on rallying support for one individual. And today that one individual seems to be cruising to the party's next uh, presidential nomination, despite facilitating uh, an attack on the constitutional order on January 6. And so um, I would also say, well, what can we do as lawyers? And at the ABA, I think we're doing a lot. I'll hold up this book. You can't see it because of Zoom's thing, but it's called Lawyers Without Rights. And it's a book that was published to describe the disenfranch 
chastisement of Jewish lawyers in the interwar period. And I think that we need to all as legal professionals, you know, stand up for people who are on the front lines, speak out um, while they're being attacked and demonized uh, by others. Uh, because, you know, if we don't speak up, that's when, you know, trends like what we're seeing will only uh, spike or increase. So I'll stop there and throw it over to Judge Davis. Well, I, I appreciate the comments of, of, of you, Betsy, and, and Scott, um, very powerful comments and observations. For me, um, at my age, after a long career uh, of service, uh, I'm as frightened as I've ever been for America and for all those um, countries, lawyers, individuals who look to America as a model uh, of democratic norm. Uh, about 20 years or so ago, I was privileged to serve as a member of a fact-finding mission uh, sponsored by the International Bar, jointly actually by the International Bar Association and the ABA to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, which was the breadbasket of, of Africa, uh, Mugabe uh, came out of the revolution and independence as a hero committed to, to democracy. Zimbabwe had the highest literacy rates among both males and females in all of Africa, certainly Sub-Saharan Africa. But by the turn of the century, something had shifted in Zimbabwe very terribly. And I remember going and being a part of this very distinguished group to meet with uh, the judges and lawyers and uh, ordinary folks, including the president himself, um, and coming away feeling a little bit hopeful. And of course, that hope was not deserved. I wake up in America today and I can't help but think about Zimbabwe. I can't help but think about the things that Scott and Betsy have alluded to, the, the, the loss of respect for and trust in our institutions, the, um, the capture of the structural uh, features of our democracy that enable uh, uh, minority rule. And as Professor Sunstein mentioned, just the denigration of human dignity in such a rapid period of time is just head spinning to me. And so I'm very concerned. Uh, I don't think that we are crying wolf those of us who are on this side of the, of the concern. And what lawyers can do most of all, what we've learned in the last four or five years in this country, what lawyers must do is say no. Lawyers must not become a part of efforts to undermine democracy, which is what we've seen in this country. And I'm hoping against hope that the regulatory apparatus of uh, the American systems in the 50 states and in the District of Columbia bring lawyers to account for their efforts to undermine democracy and the rule of law in service of would-be autocrats. Um, so we have a lot of work to do as members of the bar, as thought leaders in our institutions and in our nonprofits and down on the ground and dealing with everyday people in our synagogues and our mosques and our churches and our schools and our community organizations. Lawyers do all of that and should be doing all of that. I don't Judge, wanna... if, I can, if I could jump in um, on that accountability point um, and just share a couple of other data points that are I think relevant and, and, and maybe a little bit of hope. Um, one is, I, I think Judge Davis is absolutely right about the importance of accountability. And we see uh, very clearly in our data, a deteriorating expectation of accountability, particularly for those in high places. So um, among the survey questions we ask is whether a high ranking official who takes public funds for private gain will be held accountable. And between 2016 and 2021, again, 30% decline 
in the expectations of citizens that there will be accountability. So that's clearly a lawyer's business is to ensure accountability um, where there's wrongdoing. At the same time, the hope, uh, the hopeful note that I'll, I'll throw out there, maybe we can cling to and, and build on is that notwithstanding these kind of deteriorating expectations of what's what's you know what's happening and what is is going to happen um what we find in our survey data is that Americans still believe in the rule of law that in, and have a, a a clear sense of what is right and wrong so we ask um for example um whether the president should be bound by the law and the courts and 84 percent of Americans say yes and that's much higher than we find when we ask that question in France and Germany and Japan, other G7 countries, significantly higher in the United States. So there's, there's, and perhaps most important is that that response rate is almost identical for both Republicans and Democrats. So maybe there is sometimes we 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 focus a lot on the the divisions in our country, um, but I do think that maybe there is some common. Um, commonality uh, around these principles of rule of law, accountability, um, democratic governance on which we can build and build consensus. Well, Betsy, um, I just want to uh, just jump in here with a couple of thoughts. You um, raised the concept a little bit earlier of tipping point, and I think we're all accustomed to seeing that in the conversation about climate change these days, just the idea that th there's going to be a point of no return. Nobody really knows necessarily precisely where that is, but there are points of no return. And some of the writers out there, some of the scholars, some of the thinkers on this subject um, believe that we're closer to that tipping point than others do. They don't necessarily say exactly where it is, but, um, and, and so, you know, just to put that idea out there to underscore what you said earlier, that we shouldn't take it for granted that we've got forever to deal with this um, because we don't, and it's not just for right now, there may be a point where the consequences are forever kinds of consequences. Um, the other thing I just wanted to throw out there is that as this program was being developed, um, I mean, starting months and months and months ago, there was some pushback um, uh, because, um, uh, you know, as, as we thought about how to write it up, how to frame the issues, um, there was uh, there were people who thought that this was maybe a little too sensationalistic, um, a little too apocalyptic, a little too dire, and that we needed to put a happier face on it. Um, and and I, the more I read about it, the more I became convinced that as as I'm going to oversimplify this, but you know, some of the writers say this is precisely the problem: is that everyone is seeing the trees and not the forest. And I think that goes for a lot of lawyers as well. Um, well, some of us are seeing the trees. Some <laughs> of us are very much focused on the trees. And there's no more frightful for me as a retired judge committed to the rule of law, committed to democratic norms. Um, no more frightful a tipping point than to have, well, there are lots of frightening tipping points. But one for me was when the, the candidate for president says, I'm going to pardon the people who engage in insurrection against the United States, who have been convicted after having been afforded the full panoply of due process rights and regularized court proceedings. He's, he's promised to undermine democratic principles um, of no person being above the law. If, if that's not a frightening tipping point, I don't know what, what could possibly be. Of course, he's already done that. He, he, when he was in office, he actually used the pardon power in a way that was profoundly corrupt, profoundly corrupt. And so we have lots of tipping points to confront as we go forward, as we have in the recent pasts. 
I might just jump in and echo some of the judge's comments, Lisa. I, I, I think it, and I'm not challenging you for asking that question, but I, I really wanna emphasize multiple tipping points because I think if we get too fixated on a single point of no return, then we're not going to effectively mobilize to take real action against the incremental steps that take you to the cliff. Uh, and so I, I really just want to strongly endorse what Judge Davis said. Yes, I was I was way too simplistic. I apologize for that. You're, of course, both right and, and very eloquently, uh, very eloquently put. Um, maybe, um, well, I hate to cut this short. So uh, all of this kind of flows together, feel free to backtrack, but maybe we should talk a little bit about another element of our topic today, which is the global impact of the state of US democracy. Um, and like Judge Davis, actually like Betsy, like Scott, I've done a lot of work overseas. And I can tell you, um, you know, I, I get a lot of this stuff you know, thrown back in my face. I get reminded of the shortcomings of the US's democracy, of its justice system, um, you know, with some regularity when I travel abroad. So, um, you know, could could you say a little bit about that, please, about, about um, you know, the, the global impact of what we're seeing in terms of, um, you know, any decline in democracy here? Well, I'll, I'll jump. Go I'll, ahead, Judge. No, no, please go ahead, Betsy. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, we 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 truly are a model, or we used to be, and we aspire to continue to be. Um, I I went to Kenya in the run up to, uh, I think it was the two thousand and three presidential election at a time when um, the prospect for violence uh, surrounding the presidential election in Kenya was very high. And the Supreme Court of Kenya had recently embraced the one person, one vote principle from our law. They actually cited United States Supreme Court uh, 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 opinions for that principle. And so I went to Kenya as a, as a part of a group, I think it was USAID in fact, um, but in any event, I was there for several days, uh, a couple of weeks before the election to tout democratic principles and to talk about, as a, as a federal judge, to talk about the importance of the one person, one vote principle that is so deeply embedded now in our in our in our law, and in one of the appearances on Kenyan television, this was in 2003, maybe it was late 2002. Um, the first question I got uh, during this Sunday morning broadcast, I'll never forget it, was, "Okay, Judge Davis, you're here in Nairobi, touting the importance of democratic norms and one person, one vote. What about Bush v. Gore?" And I'm sure every judge who went anywhere in the two years after the Bush v. Gore uh, 2000 election proceedings got that question. And in fact, I think I had talked about it even before I left uh, on this mission to, to Kenya. And the answer that uniformly, to my knowledge, judges and other government officials came up with when they were asked this question as we travel around the world uh, trying to support democratic efforts, we said, yes, it was something of a mess, um, but our court system did what our court system is supposed to do. And most importantly of all, and here's the answer to your question, Lisa, most importantly of all, when Al Gore heard the court's decision, he immediately went on television and said, that's the end. That's the end of this election cycle. The court has spoken. We accept the, the, the court's decision. There are no soldiers in the streets. There are no, there's no rioting in the streets. We, we transfer power. 
I don't know what a judge would say today after January 6, 2021, to a question like that. So I have to believe that around the world, um, people who care about democracy in their own countries, and lawyers in particular, lawyers and judicial officials, uh, justice ministry officials all over the world, look at us now and say, I don't know if I can use the United States as a model for anything, for anything supportive of democracy. Now that's that's a that's a harsh judgment, but it's a judgment that I I believe is accurate. Wow, it's very uh, very telling. I, I, the anecdote um, hits hard. I think um, uh, judge, the judge's um, concerns there are, are really well founded. I, I would just add, you know, we really see two ways, at least two ways, in which the deterioration in in democracy and rule of law in the United States ripples out across the globe, and 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 this is a global phenomenon, a deterioration of rule of law. It's every in our index, we see it in every region in rich and poor countries, um, uh, just a very persistent trend. Um, so whether, you know, the U.S. is a part of that, whether it's cause or effect or part of this global thing, I think it's 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 difficult to really tease out, but there are a couple of ways in which the U.S. Um, trends do affect uh, the global trend. And one is it, we definitely see copycat behavior. So, um, you know, as Professor Sunstein mentioned, I think earlier, you know, with, with demonizing of the media as fake, you know, anything that's critical is fake news. Um, you see that rippling across the rhetoric of other um, leaders. Or, literally those words, literally. like fake news, right? right. Fake news, that's an accepted term. Right, or elections that don't go your way is being stolen. Um, so that's, um, pretty telling. And the other is, you know, as, as Judge Davis alludes, and Scott can probably speak to from experience, it really does uh, undermine the leadership ability of the U.S. to promote these norms around the world. You saw it a little bit in the in the Summit for Democracy. It's It's been a heroic and, and important process that the U.S. has tried to champion uh, democracy again in the last couple of years, but there's some skepticism. Uh, that the world community brings to these efforts after what we've been through over the last couple of decades. Betsy, I'm glad that you raised the um, uh, Summit on Democracy here, uh, a little bit of a frolic and a detour, but we have lawyers um, watching from our audience here um, who may not be familiar with the Summit on Democracy. Could, so could you just say a few words about what that is? Uh, sure, and 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 Scott, um, chime in too because you were very active in the rule of law cohort, but the uh, around the Demo democracy summit. So this was an initiative started by the Biden administration in twenty twenty one. Was the first um, convening, and it was really intended to rally the the world's democrats to uh, to be those democracy entrepreneurs <laughs> that. Uh, that Professor Sunstein mentioned and uh, really try to reverse some of the negative trends that we've seen around the world with a particular focus on combating corruption and uh, promoting um, free media and freedom of association. Uh, in, in, in then this year, in just in March of this year, there was another convening of the Summit for Democracy um, where that effort um, expanded to uh, include a, a, a growing number of uh, um, objectives and, and agendas. So um, both Scott and the ABA and we at WJP were active in a rule of law cohort, which um, worked to really underscore the importance of rule of law in this democracy building effort. And, and in particular, uh, advancing access to justice for all, for um, uh, the common folk, um, you know, in, is so important also. You know, yes, accountability for those in high places is important for trust in institutions, but also judicial institutions have to deliver for, 
for everybody. And uh, that was part of the uh, summit agenda as well. Scott, did you wanna add anything from your experience with the summit? Uh, as, yes, I would. And I'd also like to just endorse the comments of Betsy and uh, Judge Davis, they, you know, very poignant, spot on. Um, let me say that the, the Summit for Democracy, I have sort of a, a mixed feeling towards because rule of law didn't have a prominent place in the first iteration. And, you know, being someone who's dedicated my professional career to rule of law, that was disappointing. And so, you know, it was a pleasure to join forces with Betsy and others to get it elevated by the time of the second summit. And, I'm, and I think that was a, an all's well that ends well, right? And so that was, that was a good sign. But it also was, you know, for me, it was sort of telling that we had to make that case for rule of law as vigorously as we did. And uh, it means programs like this and similar ones are absolutely critical to, you know, bringing rule of law down from the stratosphere and making it tangible for everyday people. Um, I also wanted to, you know, reflect on your initial question, Lisa, about how did this impact our work abroad? So when I first went overseas, you know, 30 years ago, uh, as a part of this, you know, pro bono volunteer program in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union to try to help our legal colleagues transition to democracy and the rule of law, we were meted, met with uh, just open arms in many places and just enthusiasm. And that was because of the US's reputation for rule of law and democracy. And I would say one of the, one for me, and this is, I think the hope that I would like to share with everyone today is that We'd done some tough stuff. You know, I grew up in the Deep South uh, under when segregation was present, and I participated as a, a young kid in busing because it was the right thing to do to stop racial segregation. And if you go back to the Deep South now, you can see the changes. And this is in my lifetime, and it's miraculous. It was hard. You know, was there violence? There was. Were there challenges? But it worked ultimately. And I think we had such a powerful story to tell about social change. And I think with the sort of regression we're facing now, that's where, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, we worked so hard for all of this, you know, and is it really so tenuous? And I think the answer to that is, for me, I think We've got momentum. I think you see a lot of people uh, waking up, if you will, uh, uh, you know, pardon the expression, I guess, but, and that is, I think, critical to defending democracy because democracy is not something that's static that you purchase at a store. Um, rule of law is not something static that a judge hands down. It's something that, you know, everyday citizens as well as lawyers have to protect and preserve, you know, every single day. You're on mute, Judge Davis. I'm sorry, you warned us about that, Lisa. Thank you. Scott, your, your comments are, are so poignant and, and really resonate with me so deeply. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be a part of that cohort of federal judges who in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, um, because I had no young children at home, uh, I was free to fly off to Moscow and Almaty and Kazakhstan. And, and the judges in those former Soviet republics talk about open arms. It was, it, it was, it was just absolutely some of the most moving um, professional relationships you can imagine for, for lawyers from the ABA uh, and other lawyers and, and judges, certainly, and federal judges, not just federal judges, but state judges as well. Uh, actually, when I went to Kazakhstan, I, I was actually still on the state bench. But there was this wonderful opportunity at the invitation of these judges who, frankly, 
had never before been real judges. I mean, they would tell you this. They, they, they acknowledged in, in private conversations that they needed to learn to be, quote unquote, real judges because they were pretty much party apparat part of the party apparatus. And, and one of the most remarkable things was there were so many women judges, female judges all over these countries. And I would often, I would say, how is it that what appears to be just this incredible uh, equality principle at work here with all these uh, female judges? Well, the answer often was, it, it, it was not a position that any, frankly, any man who aspired to power <laughs> wanted. And it, and it all flipped because now here you, I, I'll never forget when I had judges, a whole cohort of the first female judges in Egypt come to, the, come, come to Baltimore and spend a couple of days just to visit the court and the police department and all of that. So there was all of this opening up of democratic opportunity all over the world in the, in, in the mid to late 90s and, and, and continuing. And now, as you put it, Scott, it's, it's this incredible regression that we see. Uh, the question I have for, for Scott and, and for Betsy along these lines, you know, I think about the Arab Spring and the role that social media and technology played in this emerging democratic, uh, you know, bursting of democratic principles. Uh, what's happening now with with technology in your work, and are we able to use technology um, and social media in particular to further democratic advances? I, I just don't know. Well, I, I'm I'm happy to take a first crack at that, Betsy. I, I love that question, Judge Davis. So we actually have a whole series of programs which uh, fall under what, the rubric of what we call internet freedom. Um, and if I think about the arc of the last 20 years, it was sort of the rise of social media, uh, the Arab Spring, a lot of sharing of democratic ideals and aspirations very rapidly. And then it's like the governments of the world woke up and said, you know what? This is dangerous. We need we need to throttle this. We need to get this under control. And you started to see a wave of restrictions rolling out across the world. Uh, you saw China, you know, supporting technology for really monitoring the internet. And then there was an, another back push with encryption and encrypted tunnels so that activists could continue to communicate with that. And I worked on some programs that. Uh, you know, looked at interesting technology that can protect activists and people who want to, you know, coordinate and talk to one another. But it wasn't as easy, right? And now the technology has gone even further. And and in places like Russia, you you know, you see someone like uh, Vladimir Putin just shuts things off, just says nope, no more. Uh, and then you have the, I think the the troubling trend of some of the social media companies so desperate for the advertising markets of places like China, that they're willing to cooperate a little bit in what I would call censorship, uh, to put it nicely. And, uh, you know, we're, we're now at a new point where we have to rethink what are the things that we need to do to protect internet freedom, because that's the new, um, medium for international discourse. So wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you for it, Judge Davis. Just one little um, data point before we move on, our, our time is getting short. Um, I, I think probably even in the US, a lot of people don't know, but, but certainly um, to the extent we've got an audience uh, from overseas, a couple of years ago, I think it's a couple of years ago now, the Conservative Political Action Committee, called CPAC for short, um, at their big conference, which that year was held in Texas, the keynote speaker was Orban. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is who and what was being um, being glorified. Um, to resounding applause, to resounding applause. To, resound, to resounding applause, to tremendous acclaim. That's exactly right. 
Um, so uh, again, before we run out of time, I do want to touch on the, the third aspect, which we've already- I'm sorry, I thought Betsy wanted to just chime in. Oh, I'm sorry. Quickly. Well, Thank no, I was, um, it, it relates. It'll be a nice segue, um, mm -hmm. Judge, um, to what do lawyers do. Um, I, I really wanted uh, to uh, maybe pick up on some of the nostalgia that Judge Davis and Scott had for the 90s and, and really suggest that maybe what we ought to be doing now is flipping that a little bit um, and, um, and rekindling um, those relationships with um, um, democracy entrepreneurs around the world um, and, uh, and, and, and actually with great humility, um, look to learn from colleagues around the world. Um, I think that that would really benefit um, democracy in the United States. As I mentioned in our index, the U.S. is 26th out of um, 140 countries. There are three former Soviet states that rank higher in the index than the United States. So you know, it's maybe now time for the the teacher um, to be the student and and study some transitions. And, and bring some of that uh, learning home uh, here in the United States, uh, and particularly uh, around some of the things that have been longstanding weaknesses in, in the US. So, you know, we're 26th out of 140 countries overall, but we're 115th in affordability and accessibility of the justice system, and 121st in discrimination in the civil justice system. So we've got a lot of work to do and a lot to learn from others around the world. And, and, and let me just put one final plug in for the sustainable development goals as a framework for that kind of uh, uh, even playing field and, and, and collective global learning about strengthening the rule of law. Um, you know, the, the sustainable development goals set a bunch of targets for every country, including the United States. That was a big innovation between the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals were the developed countries telling the developing world, you know, what they should aim for. And in 2015, with the Sustainable Development Goals, it became a global um initiative with goals that we should all be working toward. And we have a lot of work to do here in the US. Those, those targets um, should focus our attention. Um, and, and quite frankly, the US has not taken the sustainable development goals very seriously to date, either in its development policy or in its domestic policy. And there's a big summit coming up in September at the UN. And I think it would be a great step for the US to take that process seriously. And among other things, undertake a voluntary national review of our own progress toward the goals. This is a process where every member state of the UN can report on how it's doing and the progress it's making uh, toward the goals. And every country in the world has undertaken one of these voluntary national reviews, save five. The five are Haiti, Myanmar, South Sudan, Yemen, and the United States. Now, what company is that? We need, we need to take these kinds of global commitments seriously and begin to work on this stuff at home. Uh, so we we do have a couple of comments here that I'd like to share. And by the way, you went exactly where I wanted to go. I just wanted to make sure that we don't give um, too little shrift to uh, what lawyers, you know, can, should, must do, um, you know, drawing on everything that we've heard. But let me just run through a couple of these comments and I'll do them kind of as a, as a group and then you we can, you know, react to them. Um, so one of the comments was uh, just talking about, you know, the courage of people standing up for the rule of law and for democracy and saying that it reminded um, us of the DOJ lawyers who resigned or otherwise refused to, you know, go along with um, uh someone some of what was happening back in 2020, 2021. Um, a, a question specifically directed at you, Scott. Could Mr. Carlson talk a bit about the ABA Rule of Law Initiative or any of the programs um, it has in cooperation with law schools? 
And then um, last thing, we, we got a comment from the chair of our UN and um, International Organizations Committee thanking um, you, Betsy, for the plug for the SDGs. <laughs> I was I'm, I'm I'm also very happy that we got around to that. So reactions anyone to those and and the specific question for you, Scott. I'm happy to take that specific question. So the rule of law initiative currently is in I think approximately 65 countries around the world. Uh, we're the largest we've ever been. We do have some great collaboration with law schools. But I will say, if I think back to when I started uh, uh, working with the ABA as a pro bono volunteer 30 years ago, the nature of that collaboration has changed. And uh, 30 years ago, we had what we called the Sister Law Schools Program, where we matched law schools in the United States with foreign law schools and tried to foster relationships for exchange of learning and ideas. And, uh, you know, if I think about what the sort of arc of history has been is that, you know, as we move forward, some of those sister relationships still go on, but the emphasis declined. And I think part of that was donor driven. Uh, the donors weren't as focused on legal education as time rolled on. But the other thing was, I think that law schools, you know, and began being viewed also in more political terms in a number of places that we worked. And so there was a, I, I think there's been a rise of political control over law schools by, you know, executive authorities. And in many, you know, many countries, you know, the accreditation of law schools is done by, uh, you know, central authorities. Whereas in the United States, the American Bar Association uh, a nonprofit independent entity does the accreditation of law schools. And so the consequences of cooperating on things that aren't popular with the government in many places, um, they're higher. And that has been a real impediment. Thank you. Um, any other reactions to the comment about the DOJ attorneys? I I saw everyone's eyes light up and, and I think the, you know, the mental applause, but anything further on that? We are at 2.30, so um, if there's nothing else, if no one um, wants to add anything else about what lawyers can or should or must be doing, then we'll go to closing thoughts. I do want to give you a chance to um, leave the audience with some words of wisdom. Um, why don't we uh, begin with you, Scott? Um, I'd like to leave the audience with this quote. It's a favorite quote of mine by uh, the famous anthropologist Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world because, in fact, they are the only thing that ever has. It's one of my favorites as well. You just stole it from me, by the way. <laughs> Gonna have to quickly come up with another final thought, uh, Betsy. Um, yeah, well, I'll I'll combine my final reflections with your last question about what lawyers can do, and it builds off of Scott's observation, which is um, there's lots that lawyers can and should do, and uh, individually and collectively, and it all matters. Um, and I I really do think that that can turn the tide. Um, we've seen it in lots of the countries that Judge Davis and Scott have worked in over the years, and um, and we can do it here too. And that includes things like civic education, um, uh, explaining the justice system, um, rebuilding trust in it um, a, as you do so, um, shoring up the election system, making sure that people have access to the right to vote, um, that uh, that elections are carried out in a way that garners trust that there's nonpartisan election monitoring and and really working hard to close the justice gap here in the United States, increase access to justice through um, pro bono support for legal aid uh, and, and, and and importantly, support for the provision of legal services by non lawyers um, where appropriate. I think we've got lots of work to do there in order to make sure that we demonstrate that 
justice systems deserve trust and deliver for democracy. Wow, um, I, I can't. For, I'm sorry, just hold on a second. Further to what you were saying, Betsy, um, one of the um, members of our audience also just noted that um, you know we we as lawyers need to be working more with non-lawyers too, which I think was inherent in what you were saying. Uh, Judge Davis, you get the last word. Well, I couldn't possibly improve on what Betsy has said, which, and I just want to associate myself with everything she said and, and Scott. Uh, but being a big fan of irony, of course, I can't resist quoting Shakespeare. Um, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. And I, and I hope that all of the participants in this webinar fully appreciate the irony of Shakespeare's words. Because if you want to destroy not just democracy, but if you want to destroy civilization as we know it, you get rid of the lawyers. And he's frozen now on my screen anyway, but he left it at a great high point. Um, so let me just say, I would be remiss if I failed to acknowledge the international law section staffers who have helped make today possible. Uh, Lavinia Cousin, who is here with us now, as well as Christina Hyde, Ginny Choi, and Angela Benson in particular. And um, uh, I went to Northeastern University Law School, which is, as I think everybody knows, um, very lefty and crunchy granola, and was even more so when I was back there uh, many, many years ago. And so since the Winston Churchill quote was stolen from me, and the Shakespeare quote was stolen, and, 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 and then Scott got the other one. I'm gonna give you one from Abby Hoffman, which just seems totally appropriate. Democracy is not something you believe in or a place to hang your hat, but it's something you do. You participate. If you st stop doing it, democracy stumbles. So um, I'm gonna um, uh, thank you all for joining us for this important program. Please be sure to tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern, 15 Greenwich Mean Time for the final webinar in this series, Defending Democracy, Human Rights, and the Rule of Law Around the Globe. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>